Um, briefly about prognostic factors, there are a number of factors that have been associated with either improved or, 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 or poorer outcomes in terms of not only how quickly the disease may progress in terms of requiring treatment, uh, how quickly it may uh, relapse after treatment is given, and in terms of, uh, in terms of the overall survival of, of patients with CLL. Um, some traditional risk factors include uh, clinical um, parameters, things like the disease stage, patient age, um, uh, have been you know, long known to be important um, prognostic factors for a variety of reasons. Um, and more recently, there's been a number of newer prognostic, I say newer in, in quotations, I mean some of these have been around now for the better part of the last um, 15 or more years, but certainly um, the mutational status of so-called immunoglobulin heavy chain gene, so that area of the uh, B-cell receptor, which uh, I mentioned earlier on, undergoes the somatocarpal mutation, that status tends to, or it does have prognostic information, whether you have an unmutated or mutated uh, gene. Beta-2 microglobulin, which has uh, been carefully looked at uh, as a prognostic marker at the MD Anderson. Um, CD38 is something that's routinely available through flow cytometry, and then a very important test uh, called interface fish cytogenetics, of which there are some more favorable um, abnormalities, the so-called deletion of, of chromosome 13, the long arm, or worse um, prognosis abnormalities, that's the 11Q and the 17P deletion. And uh, these all have shown independent um, um, uh, prognostic properties and, and, and uh, can be used um, to uh, assist in planning treatment and, and potentially determining optimal therapy. Um, many, I think, are probably familiar with the, with, the, with the staging system, so I just put it up just for the purposes of, of um, uh, making sure all are, all are aware. The RISE staging system is primarily used in um, primarily used in North America, uh, and it is a system that includes clinical factors. You can see uh, if you have only lymphocytosis, so only a high lymphocyte count in the bloodstream, but no other manifestations of the disease, you would have stage zero, and that's low-risk disease and historically at least has uh, represented about 30 percent of cases. The green is the intermediate uh, risk category, which includes either um, uh, swollen lymph glands and or swollen uh, liver or spleen, and if there's a drop in the red blood cell count or platelet count below the numbers that are seen there, then you can have more uh, high-risk disease by staging criteria, stage three or four. Over in Europe, it's the uh, Binet system that's been more commonly used, similar in principle, but uh, slightly different in terms of the specific criteria. It, uh, it, it uh, focuses on lymph, lymph node areas uh, and then the, uh, the anemia and thrombocytopenia shown earlier. And on the far right of the graph, you see at least back when these were developed, what the outcomes were in patients who had um, um, uh, uh, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk disease. Um, I, I think it's probably fair to say that these numbers don't apply now. This was back in an era where there was pretty much just uh, sort of alkylator-based chemotherapy drugs. This is before many of the advances in chemotherapy and targeted therapies existed. So certainly, I think it's reasonable to, to, to say that outcomes have, uh, have, uh, have, have improved. Um, there's a uh, sort of a characteristic, as I've mentioned, fish uh, panel, this test called fluorescence in situ hybridization where you're actually probing for specific um, uh, deletions of, uh, of chromosomes which contain important, uh, in, in some cases, important uh, tumor suppressor or, or other abnormalities. Um, and, and the characteristic um, curves related to patients who have um, have uh, one or other of these abnormalities, with the 17P deletion being a, a notoriously high-risk situation, one that's associated with relatively poor outcomes, and others that have a more favorable outcome. Um, more just uh, for information or to be familiar, there, are, there certainly are a number of evolving understandings of, of, uh, of the um, um, molecular uh, basis for the disease and prognosis that include um, mutations that are not going to be picked up by fish. I would say that in lar largely these are not yet um, sort of in routine clinical practice, but the point is, is that, you know, is that the understandings of these, uh, of, of patient prognosis is, is continuing to, uh, to grow rapidly. These um, uh, types of uh, mutations are now being incorporated into prospect of clinical trials to better understand the significance of them and better understand um, the therapeutic implications of them. Uh, 
in terms of uh, initial workup, um, I think, uh, again, this is fairly uh, straightforward. I mean, patients need a full history physical, and they need to confirm the diagnosis with this test called flow cytometry. Um, it is interesting how many referrals uh, you get in with a di diagnosis of CLL that haven't actually had formal testing done and information already being given to patients before they've had a formal diagnosis made. And, you know, the truth is there are sometimes are other related types of lymphomas or diseases that need to be excluded or evaluated for. Um, prognostic marker testing, I think, is a, a, an important issue. Um, certainly the availability or the utility of uh, some of the markers that I've mentioned uh, in clinical practice um, uh, w uh, have to be carefully looked at. Um, uh, certainly we would, uh, at the JCC, have availability to, uh, to have interphase FISH testing done. Um, Clearly, there's, uh, there's um, value from a patient perspective in many cases to, to what these results might be. From the clinical perspective, uh, generally speaking, it's useful to have that test done prior to beginning therapy at least. Um, uh, there are others that aren't as accessible for us, at least uh, in, in Ontario. Um, we can't routinely get uh, the mutational status testing done. Um, ZAP70 is a test that, although uh, seems to have quite powerful uh, prognostic properties, has been difficult to roll out into routine clinical practice because the assay to, uh, to test for it has been difficult to become reproducible. But it's, um, so it's, not also, it's also not done routinely. Uh, CT scanning or, uh, is really not required uh, at diagnosis in, 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 in most cases, and CT surveillance is also, generally speaking, discouraged. And bone marrow aspirate and biopsy is, generally speaking, not required uh, in most cases uh, at diagnosis either, um, unless there's a need to understand uh, abnormal blood counts um, and whether there may be other uh, factors contributing to it. Um, but it certainly isn't required to make the diagnosis of CLL, and, um, and, and we don't do it at, uh, at baseline to better define uh, the prognostic property of the marrow infiltrate. Um, there's um, very standardized criteria called the Halleck criteria. You might uh, meet him later on today. Um, uh, that have been developed and have been widely um, adopted in terms, of, um, in, in terms of when therapy is required. So again, there isn't, there isn't any, event, there isn't any um, uh, improvement in important clinical outcomes by treating patients until there are symptoms that develop. And the symptoms that are widely um, um, regarded as uh, reasonable indications for therapy are listed there. Certainly if there are tender or uncomfortable nodes, enlarging symptomatic spleen, uh, 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 size of the spleen, um, if the blood counts are falling to low levels and symptoms related to that develop, these constitutional symptoms of fatigue and B symptoms, and as I mentioned earlier, poorly controlled autoimmune complications are all fairly uh, common indications for, for therapy. This concept of the lymphocyte doubling time in patients who have a very short doubling time, less than six months to a year, um, that is, a, uh, is also potentially an indication for, for therapy and has been uh, adopted in clinical trial um, related in, uh, uh, criteria, however, has to be, I think, um, uh, put into context. Uh, so really the idea here is we're faced with a scenario where things are rapidly progressive. It's pretty clear there's going to be problems that are on the horizon. Is there a need to really wait for something bad or some complication to happen? Maybe it's just time to get on and deal with the disease. Um, clearly there can be other things that might cause the white blood cell counts to fluctuate up and down that have to be evaluated first, whether it be infection or other sorts of complications. So I would, I would consider that, if you like, a little bit of a looser indication for, for treatment. And there isn't really any magic number necessarily by which treatment is required, and it's not uncommon for me to get uh, 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 patients who have been told when their white count hits 100, it's time for chemotherapy. And that, that really isn't the case. It's these, it's these other clinical manifestations that are going to dictate the need for therapy. And certainly, um, uh, in the absence of that, uh, there's the potential that the white count could get up to much higher levels and, and safely continue with, uh, with, with clinical observation 